Welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. This episode is brought to you by Lynda.com. And as you will no doubt be aware, this is the final episode of Season 18. We'll be back in June with Season 19. If you do need a history fix in the intervening time, Angus is starting a new podcast looking solely at the Second World War. In the first episode, he talks to Paul Hilditch of the Northern World War II Association about the German half-track. The first episode goes out on the 1st of May and you'll find it on iTunes. Just search for WW2 Podcast, that's the number 2. And for more information, have a look at the website www2podcast.com. I'll remind you of those details at the end of this week's episode and also be giving you some information about a nice little competition we're going to run between now and season 19. So do stay tuned for all of that. The History Network dot org podcast season 18 episode 10 the dardanelles from the time of homer a small strait of water from the aegean to the black sea has proved both a strategic crossing point and a symbolic one being the divide between europe and asia it has provided a line from which invasions have started and a channel when blocked that prevents access to the wider world from the Black Sea. The Dardanelles, situated in what is now northwest Turkey, is 38 miles long and just three quarters of a mile wide at its thinnest point. From the Aegean it runs to the small inland sea of Marmara, which connects the Bosphorus, another strait 17 miles in length, to the Black Sea. Its length and width make the Dardanelles feel like a tidal river. Its strong currents have always made traversing it under sail to be a hazardous business, with ships needing to wait for conditions to be just right before making any attempt to navigate it. In ancient times it was known as the Hellespont, the Sea of Helle. Helle was a character in the Greek Golden Fleece myth who is said to have drowned there. The ancient city of Troy was located near the western entrance of the strait. Its location allowed it to act as a trading point between the Mediterranean and Asia, profiting from merchants passing from the Black Sea to the Med. It's referred to in Homer on a number of occasions, when Hermes is ordered by Zeus to escort Priam on his hazardous journey to ransom Hector's body. The god arrives at Troy and the Hellespont. Homer also has the Greeks camped near it when the Greeks are driven back to the ships and the Hellespont. The classical scholar Robert Wood sailed up the strait in the 1760s and described it, probably not much changed since the time of Homer. When I was sailing upwards from the Aegean Sea into the Hellespont, we obliged to make our way against a constant smart current, which, without the assistance of a north wind, generally runs about three knots in an hour. At the time we were landlocked on all sides, nothing appeared in view but rural scenery, and every object conveyed the story of a fine river running through an inland country. In this situation I could hardly persuade myself I was at sea, and it was as natural to talk about its comparative breadth as to mention its embouchure, its pleasant stream, its woody banks, and all those circumstances which only belong to a river. The Persian army of Xerxes to invade Greece built a pontoon bridge over the Hellespont, When a storm erupted and washed it away, Herodotus, in his histories, writes, Xerxes flew into a rage at this, and he commanded that the Hellespont be struck with three hundred strokes of the whip, and that a pair of foot-chains be thrown into the sea. He also commanded the scourgers to speak outlandish and arrogant words. You hateful water! Our master lays his judgment on you thus, for you have unjustly punished him, even though he's done you no wrong. Xerxes the king will pass over you 
whether you wish it or not. It is fitting that no man offer you sacrifices, for you're a muddy and salty river. In these ways he commanded that the sea be punished, and also that the heads be severed from all those who directed the bridging of the Hellespont. The waters now chastened, a second attempt at bridging was successful. In 334 BC, Alexander the Great crossed the Hellespont in the opposite direction, signalling the start of his invasion of the Persian Empire. He and his men were ferried across by boat. It was the symbolic line to cross, as Ariane writes. When he was in the middle of the channel of the Hellespont, he sacrificed a bull to Poseidon and the Nereids and poured a libation from a golden cup into the sea. They say that he was the first to disembark from the ship onto Asian soil in full armour. He set up altars to Zeus of safe landings, Athena and Heracles, both where he had started from in Europe and in the place where he disembarked in Asia. A Greek colony of Byzantium had been founded in 657 BC at the mouth of the Bosphorus and the Sea of Marmara, when in 330 AD it became the capital of the Roman Empire and was renamed Constantinople. The area was now at the centre of the Roman world. The Dardanelles were crucial to the defence of the city by sea. If invested by land, provided the waterways remained open, the city would not starve. In this manner Constantinople survived numerous sieges. In the 7th century the use of Greek fire allowed Byzantine fleets to destroy Arab ships. Though when Constantinople fell in 1453, access to the sea and the Dardanelles remaining open allowed many of the hired mercenaries to escape. The area gained renewed importance with the rise of the Russian Empire. In a world where a navy allowed a country to project power beyond her shores, Russia was hamstrung when it came to having access to a warm water port, a port that doesn't freeze. Russia wanted access to the Mediterranean from the Black Sea via the Dardanelles. Since the fall of Constantinople, which had seen the end of the Byzantine Empire, the Ottomans controlled the straits. Batteries and fortifications had been built on both banks. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British made a failed attempt to subdue the Ottomans by attacking Constantinople. A small fleet sailing through the Dardanelles was harried by the shore batteries all the way. When the Ottoman fleet failed to sail from harbour to fight, the British withdrew. They then suffered the ignominy of being attacked once more from the fortifications that lined the route. Later the same year, 1807, the Russians managed to successfully blockade the entrance to the Dardanelles, causing food shortages in Constantinople. When the Ottomans sailed out to lift the blockade, they received a drubbing from the Russian fleet. Once more the shore batteries proved their worth, beating back the Russians as they attempted to pursue the retreating ships. In the gunpowder age, the batteries and forts placed along the Dardanelles made it very difficult for an enemy to force their way through without resulting in heavy losses. This gave the Ottomans control of the access to the Black Sea, on which Russia had ports. From this point on, it became increasingly clear that to open the straits, a land element of any force would be needed. It could not be done by naval strength alone. Adrian Duckworth, who had led the lacklustre attack on Constantinople in 1807, wrote to his Russian counterpart when asked to sail through the straits once more. But before the undertaking is again attempted, there is one condition on which my duty to my sovereign will oblige me to insist. Having passed and repassed the Dardanelles, and having on the second occasion seen the batteries which were beginning to be erected, and which, when completed, as they must be by the present time, would render the work still more difficult and arduous, I must, as an officer, declare it to be my decided opinion that, without the cooperation of a powerful body of land forces, it would be a wanton sacrifice of the squadrons of both nations 
to attempt to force the passage. The threat of the batteries was enough to keep anyone from attempting to force passage. The Dardanelles would be central to Russian interests, with the Ottoman Empire bottling in their shipping. In 1829, the Treaty of Adrianople opened the Dardanelles to all commercial vessels, thus liberating commerce for cereals, livestock and wood from some of Russia's most fertile areas. This was closely followed by the Treaty of Unkaya Skelesi in 1833, which brought about an alliance between the two powers, as well as a guarantee that the Ottomans would close the Dardanelles to any foreign warships if the Russians requested such action. This clearly was not welcomed by the British and other great powers. 1841 saw the Straits Convention, ratified by all the great powers of Europe, which rewrote the 1833 treaty, stating that the Dardanelles would be closed to any warships other than the Ottomans' allies during times of war, and was signed by multiple nations. So it was that during the Crimean War the British and French navies could sail through the Straits in support of their Ottoman allies. The Congress of Paris in 1856 reaffirmed the closure of the Dardanelles to any warships, so neutralising the threat of a Russian warm-water port in the Black Sea. For many people, the Dardanelles is synonymous with the First World War and Gallipoli. This time, Russia was allied with Britain and France, and Turkey with Germany. The closure of the Straits by Turkey prevented vital supplies getting to Russia. The Western Front was at a stalemate, and in early 1915, the Russians found themselves threatened by the Turks in the Caucasus and appealed for some relief. The British decided to mount a naval expedition to bombard and take the Gallipoli Peninsula on the western shore of the Dardanelles, with Constantinople as its objective. By capturing Constantinople, the British hoped to link up with the Russians and knock Turkey out of the war. The opening gambit proved encouraging to the British fleet, when bombarding fortifications at the mouth of the strait a lucky shot hit a magazine on one of the Turkish forts. The resulting explosion killed 86 and put ten guns temporarily out of action. The Dardanelles were defended by a system of fortified and mobile artillery arranged as an outer, intermediate and inner defence. While the outer defences lay at the entrance to the straits and would prove vulnerable to bombardment and raiding, the inner defences covered the narrows, the narrowest point of the straits. Beyond that, the straits were virtually undefended. However, the foundation of the straits' defences were a series of ten minefields laid across the straits, near the narrows and containing a total of 370 mines. The straits proved impregnable. Under offshore bombardment, Royal Navy Marines were put ashore to neutralise the closest Turkish gun positions, allowing the passage deeper into the Dardanelles, but the minesweepers with civilian crews made little headway. A concerted naval attack on the 18th of March 1915, with 16 battleships plus ancillary vessels, was a failure, and five ships were lost. The Chicago Tribune reported, The British ships were firing heavily and continuously. At times the smoke was so thick that it completely blotted out the horizon and totally enveloped the particular Turkish fort under fire. But time and time again the smoke cleared and showed the Turkish position virtually undamaged. It was clear if the straits were to be forced a large infantry contingent would be needed to clear the fortifications. And so it was on the 25th of April 1915, British, Australian and New Zealand troops began the landings, and so started the disastrous Gallipoli campaign. The man that organised the Turkish defence was Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, in many respects the father of modern Turkey. It is his words that can be found on the memorial in what became known as Anzac Cove. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, 
you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. After the war, the Montreux Convention regarding the Régime of the Straits of 1936, to give it its full title, gave Turkey full control over the Straits and guarantees the free passage of civilian vessels in peacetime. It restricts the passage of naval ships not belonging to Black Sea states. During World War II, the Dardanelles were closed to shipping of the belligerent nations. Since then, tensions have been strained over access, with Turkey allying herself with America and NATO, making the Russian Black Sea fleet once more at the mercy of the Turks, closing the Dardanelles. Well, there we are, folks. That is another season in the bag, and we hope you've enjoyed listening. Now, in a moment, I'll be telling you about a great little competition that we're going to run in between this season and the next one, which starts in June. So stick around for that. And as I mentioned at the start of this episode, it's brought to you by lynda.com, who still have this amazing offer of 10 days totally free access to every single one of their tutorials or courses and even access to new content as it's added. In case you've never heard of lynda.com before, that's l-y-n-d-a.com, they are the place to go if you want to learn anything new or perhaps even if you want to brush up on some skills you once knew but have lost touch or practice with in the meantime. Whether you want to set new financial goals, find a work-life balance, invest in a new hobby, ask your boss for a raise, find a new job or improve upon your current job skills in 2015, lynda.com has something for everyone. So here's all you need to do. Sign up for your free 10-day trial today by visiting lynda.com forward slash history net and you will get unlimited access to every course on lynda.com access to view tutorials on tablets and iPhone plus Android mobile devices, and access to any new courses added every week. Angus and I have used lynda.com over the years as we've developed the History Network and expanded it to produce the Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. We've also used it in our day job lives as well. As you'll probably know already, the History Network is a spare time operation for Angus and myself. And the beauty is that it's always easy to find what you're looking for. And the content is always there and available if you need to refer to it once in a while or again and again. So go on, invest in yourself and sign up for a free 10-day trial to lynda.com by visiting lynda.com forward slash history net. We challenge you to learn something new in 2015. So now it is competition time, where you have the possibility of winning one of three great little prizes. More on those in a moment. As you know, here at the historynetwork.org, some of our episodes are penned by listeners just like you, and some of these are some of our most popular episodes. Mark Webster was one such listener who wrote a script for us, and if you've been listening avidly this season, you'll be familiar with Mark's name, as he wrote episode 1808, Parcels from Home, the story of Red Cross parcels in World War II. Now, Mark has been kind enough to give us some codes to give away for two new books he's been involved with, Parcels from Home, Jack's War, and... Parcels from Home, the Prisoner of War Parcel Scheme and the New Zealand Red Cross in World War II. We are always on the lookout for new scripts from listeners and we love getting them because importantly, contributors bring fresh topics and ideas which we might never even think of. So we thought we'd run this little competition to encourage you to send us a script for Season 19 which starts in June. So to enter, all you have to do is submit a script you have written, at least 2,000 words in length, on a military history topic. It's pretty much that simple. And the first three scripts we receive will each win a pair of those books. 
So get writing. You have until the 31st of May to get those scripts to us. Our normal terms and conditions apply and you can find these at the website by clicking on contributions in the top navigation. We'll also set up a link on the website for these competition details should you need a reminder. And finally, please be aware that these book prizes are only available from the Apple iBook store and only available as downloads to an iPad or Apple Mac, but not an iPhone. We look forward to receiving your scripts and good luck. There are other ways you can support us too. There is the donate button at the website, thehistorynetwork.org. You can also find our past seasons there, which are chapter files for download, and each of them has a running time of between around two and five hours, depending on the season, and you'll pay just two pounds for each of them. You can get involved on the social side as well. You can like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash the history network follow us on twitter we are at history network on there go to youtube.com slash user slash the history network and take a look at our youtube channel there's lots of content there including the video podcast we produce for ancient warfare magazine and if you'd like to let us know what you think give us some ideas about podcast subjects you'd like to see come up or want to bring us up on an error or point of contention then whatever it is it's info at the history network.org for that we would love to hear from you and whether you've been a listener contributor donator liker follower watcher or emailer thank you for coming along with us this season and we hope to have you along for season 19 beginning in June. If you need your history fix in the meanwhile, don't forget Angus's new podcast starting on May the 1st. You'll find it on iTunes. Just search for WW2 Podcast. That's the number two. And for more information, have a look at the website www2podcast.com. You've been listening to The History Network, written by Angus Wallace, read by Nick Barker. (laughs) 